Hello, fellow Democrats, futurists, and problem solvers. This is After the Oligarchy. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Paul Cockshot again. Paul Cockshot is a computer engineer and Marxist economist and author of several books, but today I'm interviewing him as co-originator with Alan Cottrell of the post-capitalist model first presented in the book Towards a New Socialism, published in 1993. Today's conversation is in association with META, the Center for Post-Capitalist Civilization. This is the fourth in a series of interviews with Dr. Cockshot about Towards a New Socialism, make sure to watch the other interviews. Today we'll be discussing some more advanced questions about Towards a New Socialism, so I recommend you read the book to understand what we're talking about. It's still in print and there's free PDF available online, which I'll put in the description. So, Paul Cockshot, thank you very much for joining me again. Today, we're going to talk about worker self-management. We're going to talk about the relation between the centre and the uh, periphery or projects in central planning and in socialism in general. And how this started was, for viewers to give context, is that I, I put a quote to you from a book that was put out by Robin Hanel, who's co-originator of Participatory Economics and wrote a book called Democratic Economic Planning recently. And I, I read out a, a quote which was making uh, some criticisms of central planning on the basis that it was incompatible with worker self-management. And then we talked about that briefly, but we didn't get a chance to go into it fully. So that's what we're going to do now. So since then, I've had an interview with Robin Hanel about this topic and Dr. Cockshot has seen that as well. So I, I made the same kind of preamble when talking to Robin Hanel that just for viewers that I'm just going to ask you to approach this with an attitude of curiosity and problem solving. That this isn't about clinging to whatever political identities that we, we've we've decided that we have and trying to win a, de a debate or score points. It's about trying to create a better world and in doing that to honestly look at these problems. So I, I know that that's how Robin Hanel approaches this. I know that this is how Paul Cockshot approaches this. And I'm just asking you, the audience, to approach it like that as well. So before I ask you specific questions, are there any initial remarks you'd like to make in response to that interview that I did with Robin Hale? I think it'll all come up in the questions uh, you ask. Okay, I'd like to begin with a framing question, a general question, which is what, in your view, is worker self-management? Why is it important? And how is it achieved? How can it be achieved in a society? Well, it's fundamentally a question of overcoming the division between mental and manual labour, between those who tell people what to do and those who actually do it. And that is an old basis of class hierarchy, going back to the early stages of class society. And in a modern society, it takes the form of less educated people being told what to do by more educated people generally. Or in some cases, there may, no be, may be no difference in educational level, but people have a managerial authority, which enables them to say what's going to be done. Um, and this has the disadvantage that the ideas and initiative of people who don't have the, the mark of authority and which could improve the operation of systems, whether it's healthcare systems or industrial pr production systems, and their knowledge is disregarded or downvalued compared to the knowledge of those who are put in authority over it. Overcoming this requires the sorts of struggles that were partially worked out during the Cultural Revolution in China. They end up with forms of organisation that were stable to deal with that. But the issues that were being raised were relevant. And they, these will certainly still be a big issue in any society where you're having radical socialist change. The, the issue of how do you get people who are initially educated members of the upper class or, or the upper middle class, the professional managerial class, who have certain skills which are necessary for society, but they have their own class interest. They have their interest in maintaining a higher social status and a higher income and authority over other people. So it, it's the issue of how do you get people who are both read and expert and how do you ensure that those who may not initially ideologically support socialism will still work for the common good? Now, to the extent over time where there's a radical improvement 
in educational levels and equalization of educational opportunity. That kind of issue may become less important to some extent. But given that in a market economy, those with qualifications tend systematically to have a higher income and towards the upper end of that, there are people who aren't actually exploited. They're either receiving something roughly equivalent to the labor they, they put in or actually receiving part of the labor that others put, put in. This means that what is in the West, the professional managerial class. There's an interest in becoming a professional managerial class in a socialist uh, economy, and they will push for the increase in their power and their authority. So it's basically a, a question of class interest, a class interest mediated through educational privilege. Okay, let's go into this further by moving into the next question. This is about specifically now towards a new socialism. Yeah. In towards a new socialism, there's there's a comprehensive plan for the production of the entire economy. And this plan is set by a planning bureau, which is overseen politically by a, a randomly selected body from the general population. And production is accomplished by projects, which we might think of as enterprises, but they're not exactly the same. And the projects implement the plan. So what decisions do workers in a project have control over and what decisions do workers in a project not have control over? Well, let's take an example where these social relations to an extent already exist in terms of the production not being enterprise-based, in, like in the British National Health Service. In that case, a hospital is equivalent to a project. Now, over time, from the 1980s onwards, running of hospitals was increasingly professionalized and handed over to a professional managerial elite who are distinct from the medical staff and ancillary workers who actually provide the care. And there was a scandal recently. You're in Ireland, you may not have seen it. There was a scandal associated with the Shrewsbury Maternity Hospital, where there was a very large number of excess neonatal deaths or babies delivered with brain damage and other injuries. Now, in pursuing what caused that, the inquiry found that it was a managerial policy to set a target to reduce the number of caesareans. Now, this is not something that was arrived at by the obstetricians or the midwives. It was a target set by professional managers. Now, by having it set by professional managers, they were overriding the clinical judgment of the medical professionals. And the result was clearly proven to be deleterious for the mothers and the babies. Now, if the management of hospitals was made up or policy was set by a committee drawn from the different sections of the medical and ancillary staff that worked there, that kind of policy would not have been arrived at. Now, exactly how the supervisory board would be formed, you have the, there's room for discussion on that, whether it would be elected, chosen by lot, by quotas or what. Had it been based on the people who actually were delivering the care, the policies would have been different. And these are policies related to how to, to treat the patients, what practices should be pursued. Now, in terms of the resources available to it, a National Health Service hospital is entirely dependent on public resources. It's entirely dependent on public funds to meet the, the, the salaries of the workers there. And it's entirely de dependent on public funds to build, maintain, etc., the hospitals. So any internal democratic control in a National Health Service hospital is going to be within the constraints set by the local health board, which provides the, the funding to it, and more generally within the, the national budget that allocates a certain amount to, to health care as a proportion of national income. So there, there is certainly room for democratic control, and there's room for replacing the professional managerial class with decisions taken by people who actually do the productive work. But it's it shouldn't be seen as a matter of autonomy of the unit 
relative to society. It's a question of internal class relations. Okay, so let me, let me ask a, a more pointed question. So I think if I had to summarize, I think Hanel's chief concern was that in central planning, and he said multiple times that towards the new socialism is the, is the most democratic version possible, that ultimately what you know an enterprise or a project produces is determined by the uh, the planning bureau by a central authority even if even if it's uh, very democratically constituted and and regulated the point that he's making is that, that there would be room for for some amount of control of the workers in a workplace but that if the outputs the production outputs and the production inputs would be set externally so is that the case in towards any socialism well you have to uh, have to look at what different kinds of organizations you're talking about lately if we take a, a hospital again it is not necessarily appropriate for one hospital to decide whether they're going to have a specialist oncology unit in that hospital or whether it would be better for at the level of a city for it to be decided which hospital would have the specialist oncology unit, which hospital would, might specialise in stroke rehabilitation, etc. So to an extent, yes, what, what, what the output they're producing is likely to be decided at a higher level insofar as in to do that they're requiring public funds or public resources which have to be used in the most efficient way now there's certainly a room for debate at the district level for people to debate do do you want to to, to have specialist hospitals or do you want general hospitals now if you take let's take another economic activity like electricity generation now whether electricity generation is going to be achieved using coal, natural gas, nuclear power, or wind, let's say, those are not decisions which can be taken by the, the workers at an individual power station. These are questions of national strategy, and they're questions which re rely, which require huge public investment to carry them out. The transformation of the economy that's going to be necessary to shift from fossil capitalism to a non-fossil fueled socialist economy is huge. And it's not a matter of the individual workers in, in one unit of production having a say on that. Now, it's certainly the case that workers in, for example, the electrical generator fabricating industry have an interest in having a say in and debating what kind of plants are going to be built because that has a direct bearing on their their future life and future opportunities and back in the 70s along with other people from the conference of socialist economists i worked with the shop stewards at trafford park plant on a workers plan for the power industry advocating in the 70s that it diversified built a net next generation nuclear power plants that tidal power was put into operation etc and that was in in response to the specific crisis that were facing the workers in the electrical power generation sector now it could only be achieved though to the extent that the workers in the electrical power generation sector were able to influence the then labor government to actually order new power plants and start new power plants. So it cannot be a matter of decision just by, by the workers in, a, in one sector. They can lobby for it, but the critical decisions are going to come from the allocation of public funds, which, or if I say public funds, but I mean the public allocation of the labor force of society. So this is a question that I, I posed to Robin Hanel and I raised the case of forms of, of production of enterprises, which one might say are particularly important, particularly strategic, essential healthcare and energy were actually the two examples that are raised and asking the question whether it suffices for a worker council governing, for example, a hospital or the examples that you gave, they have complete control over what's produced. And really, shouldn't there be a way that society as a whole can determine that? On the other hand, it's the case that those are 
enterprises or forms of production which are of, of a certain class. There are things which are life or death in the case of healthcare and climate change, or they're, they're very strategic and they involve massive investment. But there are other types of production. For example, I was just thinking off the top of my head, I'm always talking about a furniture factory as an example, or say a gym or a supermarket, or uh, you know, we could list many other forms of activity. And we'd say, well, these are not as strategic or not as essential or not as large scale. And so the question there is, for example, is it appropriate for the production activities of a gym, say, to be determined entirely by a central plan, i.e. all of the things that the gym is going to produce in terms of what classes they offer or what facilities they have and uh, and what, what they use to do that, what inputs and labor and machinery and so forth. There's no reason why it, why something like that has to be decided centrally, other than in practice, what's going to be doable is is you've got a certain number of instructors available or a certain number of clubs that want to use the facility. These clubs may well have individuals who are do a lot of the teaching, but it's that does I don't see why that requires any any particular planning beyond the resources that go into it. The, the actual operation of a gym can be largely left to the you know with the, the taekwondo club, the basketball club, etc., that are actually using the gym on different days. So can I ask this as a as a clarifying question then, just so we can understand the uh, mechanics of towards a new socialism better? So presumably then workers in a project can formulate and submit a production proposal for that project to the planning bureau. That's the only way the planning bureau is going to. Well, no, it's not the only way. I mean, once system a project has been running for a while, the only way that they will know of for instance, a new product is likely to be a suggestion from there. But that's not necessarily the case. It may be that ideas for new products come from research and development organisations. But the problem with having it done entirely by separate cell research and development organisations is that the, the transition process to production doesn't necessarily go that well. And the, the step between prototype and mass produced product may not go so well. So there's a lot to be said for the having a close integration between the design process and the production units. Um, but in some cases, the ideas for what's going to be done definitely have to come from outside. The If we take, this was most most obvious when you're, you're setting up entirely new industries like nuclear power. But any entirely new industry, either new to the country or new to the world, where it involves innovation, is likely to involve an idea of what the product is going to be that's agreed at a higher level. And then a whole set of lower level things become necessary. So if you decide that you're going to move to electric buses. That is a higher level decision and the bus factories all have to go and have to shift to doing that. And new, entirely new industries have to be created. You, you, you have to have mega factories turning out lithium electric batteries, or it may be designed that lithium's too, strategically too expensive and you're going to put the effort into to sodium batteries. But in either case, these are higher level technological shape decisions which are being taken. And to that extent, that a fact that a, a lithium battery factory is going to be making lithium batteries or it's going to be making sodium batteries, that's a higher level decision. And it might be something that the people in the factory can decide, okay, we reckon we could shift to making sodium batteries rather than lithium batteries. But they can only do that on the basis of scientific research, which is probably carried out outside, which is part of the general world achievement of scientific advance. And it always requires considerable resources to convert a scientific advance into initially a prototype and then a manufacturable prototype. So that the society has to have some way of allocating resources, preferably close to the production units, for them to change their and update their products. But 
in this, they're, 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 they're relying on outside sources of resources. It's relying on funding out for, in the end, out of general taxation to allow the factory to have, say, 10% extra people who are tasked with developing types of batteries and types of battery production which are not yet in, in place. And that is not socially necessary labour in terms of the current product. It's surplus labour. It's surplus to what's socially necessary. And it's an allocation of surplus labour that's being made from the point of view of society in planning for the future. Yeah, it's basically an investment. As in it- it's not an investment. It's an, an investment is a subcategory of an allocation of, of, of surplus labour. But it's, it, an investment is a, an allocation of surplus labour with a view to making a profit. Sure. I, I suppose, OK, I, I agree. It's not really investment. I suppose I more mean it's, it's labour that's being directed towards an activity which is not going to produce something. It, it's going to increase production in the future. It's going to open up possibilities in the future. You don't know whether it actually will increase sure. production in the future. Sure, sure, sure. No, that's fair enough. OK, so... This video is sponsored by ISINC, the Irish Strategic Institute for National Kablamo. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine, these are dangerous times, and everybody who isn't a naive, hippie, Marxist idiot living in the past knows that the Republic of Ireland needs to grow up and end its policy of neutrality. All proper countries spend loads of dosh feeding the dogs of war, and Ireland should do that too if it's going to defend itself from... Um, Russia. All right. Uh, who, although they have no geopolitical motive or plausible means to attack Ireland, remain an imminent threat. Also, China, who are tunneling through the Earth's core as we speak. For too long, Irish politicians have not had the benefit of hiding behind the words support our troops. And while bribes from the military industrial complex have been forthcoming, our leaders deserve more. For too long, middle class citizens at dinner parties have endured the humiliation of not being able to boast of Irish uniforms routinely massacring foreigners. Let's face it, Ireland's neutrality is a bit like people who only smoke socially. Sending Irish troops to Afghanistan, Mali and Chad, and even turning Shannon Airport into a de facto US military base. So we might as well start smoking 20 John Player Blue. Now you might be thinking, isn't 20% of Ireland still occupied by the British state? What about the security risk of Ireland's de facto military alliance with the United States? <laughs> No offence, but that's why I work for a think tank. Anyway, that is why Ireland must join NATO post-haste. By joining the most belligerent military bloc in modern history, we will make the world a better place, and make Ireland safer at the same time by making all of NATO's enemies Ireland's enemies. Ireland needs to pull its weight clean its room and finish its homework. Housing and hospital beds can wait. We need to buy 20 jet fighters and a handful of light ships from the Americans and Germans. This will strike fear in the heart of our enemies, like Guernsey and the Maldives. But that is not enough. The Irish Strategic Institute for National Kablamo urges the Irish state to issue every resident with a handheld tactical nuke. Neutrality is obsolete. Let the rivers run red with blood. Cade Mila Falcher, Nucleoc. Okay, guys, you heard them. The Kaplamo Institute is offering a free handheld tactical nuke to one lucky viewer who can answer this question. Does NATO's Supreme Allied Commander Europe General Toddy Walters like pineapple on pizza? Make sure to like and subscribe for the chance to win that nuke. Now, back to the show. So just before we get into our topic, which is worker self-management, balancing autonomy of production units with the social interests and so forth, uh, just a, a couple of things. So the first is that you're saying that you're actually writing a new book about planning. And do you want to just say a few words about what that is? We were approached by a publisher, uh, Repeater Books, actually. And we were approached by them a year and a bit ago to write a new book. It's Alan Cottrell, me and Philip Daprich writing it. And they wanted a book on planning that was at a 
bit more technical level than the stuff in Towards a New Socialism. But to situate it, we have situated it in the context of economic planning in an age of climate crisis, we're calling it, um, because we think that the necessity to adapt to the climate crisis is something which will force countries to start carrying out economic planning because there's no other means of doing it. The need to adapt to the climate crisis is not something that is expressed through the market. It's an existential question that operates beyond the market and requires conscious political direction. And as such, it forces the economies, whether they want it or not, to try and grapple with the issues of economic planning. So that sounds very interesting. You're saying the title, at least provisionally, is Planning in an Age of Climate Crisis. And when could we expect that to come out roughly? I know that these things aren't well, certain. It, it's been with the publishers in one form or another for some months. They they now seem to be pushing ahead with it. Okay, so maybe maybe sometime this year is what we're I would looking. expect so, yes. Okay. Yes, I would expect so. Great. And I, OK, well, I'll check in with you at some point later. And uh, Well, when it comes out, you can read it and ask questions. Great. I definitely, definitely will. I'll make sure that the first copy gets into well, my hands. Well, I'm, I'm plugging at it. We're doing another book on materialism. But in this case, the authors are myself, Greg Michelson and Katrina Kalozovitz, the Macedonian philosopher. And is that also due to come out sometime this Year? Well, we're, we're trying to get a publisher to agree to take that one. Okay. okay. We, we'll have finished writing it by the summer. Okay, very good. Okay, so that sounds very interesting. And uh, I was going to say one thing quickly, and then we'll get into the interview questions. Yeah. You just you mentioned uh, Philip Daprick, and uh, I finally got around now talking with him. I'll be talking with him tomorrow about his work on opportunity cost values yeah. and, and all that. So thank you for putting me in his direction. Well, he's he writes about that in our joint book on planning. Excellent. Okay, let's go forward. So last time we were talking about basically how do we find a balance in different instances, a socialist economy between the social interest, the interest of society as a whole and subunits of the economy, so projects and, and workers. Let's look at, say, the managerial structure of a project in towards a new socialism, because you're talking about the class struggle of trying to prevent a, a professional managerial class or coordinator class from, from taking over. So what would be the managerial structure of a typical project? And I'm sure it would vary. Well, it, I mean, it's obviously going to depend on the size and scale of the, the thing you're dealing with. If it is a, a national airline, it's a somewhat different matter from a school or a hospital, or even at a lower level, the examples you were asking me about were cafes and restaurants and things. Yes. Now, when you ask him about the cafes and restaurants, there was a sort of implicit assumption, I think, that these are like the ones you're used to, okay? That we're used to models of cafes and restaurants where they're small private businesses. You're used to cafes and restaurants that are small private businesses, but that's obviously not what all of them are. The most successful ones are things like McDonald's, which are huge, huge enterprises with coordinated production and planned production, planned delivery of everything and planned right down to the smallest detail of what goes into each type of burger and the amount of work that's required to do them, what what uh, means of production are used, etc. So you, you don't have to assume that restaurants are going to be small, self-sufficient things. They may be restaurant chains, chains still, or, I mean, in experience I had going to Soviet bloc countries, some of the restaurants were, for example, people went to eat at a particular collective farm because the, ca the canteen at the collective farm was reckoned to be good. And if you were driving through that part of Bulgaria, you'd stop off at the collective farm and eat at their canteen. And other cases, the the restaurants would belong to the municipality. There'd be a whole bunch of restaurants in the town, but they'd, they'd all belong to the municipality. The contents of the menus were highly specified. So if you were buying a meal, it specified how many grams of fish, 150 grams of fish, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, were in it. So it, it it was that was a regulation from the point of view of guaranteeing the standards that the consumer was going to get. 
and the prices were controlled as well. So you don't have to assume that things will work the way we're used to working, them working. There are lots of other models. Sure, yeah, that's interesting. Now, I don't know how the collective farm canteen was run, um, how they decided what they were going to cook. Um, but the, the things which, if it, let's take a, a large thing like Airbus. Sure. Where it's a, a big employer. It's a big employer across Europe. If Europe becomes socialist, that will continue. Airbus will continue designing and developing aircraft because it, it may become something that is under the control of the workers in, in the Airbus industry. But the fact that is a, it is a collective labourer, it is a large group of people working together, each playing a part in it to collectively produce something vast, something bigger than any individual can comprehend, is going to st stay the case. Now, the question then is, how do you remove, on the one hand, the exploitative relationship between the owners of Airbus and the people who work in it, and on the other hand, the effect that that existing exploitative relationship means that you're in a society where you have a class hierarchy and within the, that you have a managerial hierarchy. And the managerial hierarchy ultimately derives its authority from the right to hire and fire. Now, if you've got a, a socialist economy and you effectively have full employment and everyone is guaranteed a job, the, the right to hire and fire is not going to be a, a significant factor. Can we talk about that then? Because that's actually a question. So that's a very natural segue yeah. into, into that question. So in towards the new socialism, workers are guaranteed employment, but not necessarily guaranteed a job at a particular project, but they are guaranteed a job. Yeah. And this is presumably to balance the goal of full employment, which is extremely important, with the goal of avoiding apathy, cynicism, and inefficiency at the workplace. And also to ensure that you have an economy that can adapt to changing requirements. Yes, yes. I mean, as technology changes, certain industries become less important, others become more important, and people have to move between them. Yes, that's a very good point. So in that case, how are hirings and firings handled? Who in a project decides to hire or fire someone? Well, we have, this is not something that we have written about enough, but if you take what's, I say now as being my personal opinion, not something that I've agreed with on cultural. Sure. Okay. The overriding issue is the labor budget that a project has. Okay. That the society has to allocate social labor power and it does that in two ways. It does it by allocating direct labour and embodied labour. The society has to check on the efficiency of the ways things are being done. And can I just clarify for viewers, you're saying embodied labour or direct labour as in, in... In raw material, embodied labour in the form of raw materials, buildings, plant and equipment. Yeah, so that's labour that in the, in the past has been put into creating or transforming yeah. these things and direct yeah. labour is somebody actually turning up to work and labouring to do something. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Both of these are social resources, which can potentially be used for other things. And the building that is being used to make one product at the moment might be allocated to a different use in the future. And the people who are doing it might end up doing something different in the future. And a dynamic economy, that'll happen relatively often. The more dynamic the economy, the more often people move to do, to do new things. And during the of the Soviet economy, there was lots of people moving to new jobs in new places. Now, how would people get jobs? Well, I would imagine it'll come through jobs being advertised online by some national register of, of what kind of jobs there are, and people can apply for them. And it's up to the collective that you're going to work with how they choose people. Now, there'd have to be some national standards to prevent systematic bias of any sort. They couldn't just select men for interview and, and things like that. Yes, of course. So it's not an auto can't be an autonomous, can entirely autonomous business yeah. of the, that collective. Now, the issue becomes more difficult if there's a labour shortage in the economy and some line of activity has to be shrunk in order to enable something else to grow. 
under those circumstances, at the level of a plan, what you're doing is you draw up a plan and say, how many workers can we afford to have still working in the retail sector if we're going to have to build 10 gigawatts a year of new power stations? And if we're building 10 gigawatts of new a year of new power stations, how many more building workers do we need? How many engineering workers do we need, etc.? This gives requirements of how many jobs are going to be in that. And in, when you balance it out, certain sectors have got to be shrunk. Now, suppose it's the retail sector that's being shrunk and there is a retail collective has taken over, let's say, ASDA. And the, the collective, which is, let's say, is, is called the Northern Red Banner Collective now, and that's on all the, the ASDA shops, the, they're told, OK, I'm afraid we can't run so many stores. We don't have enough people in this area. We need more people working in engineering. We're going to reduce the total labor budget that the Red Banner supermarket chain can have by 10%. It's then up to the people within the Red Banner supermarket side how they're going to do that. Who's going to leave? Who wants to, re to retrain as a precision engineer, etc. But it's up to them to decide how to do it. They just said, OK, a year from now, the state plan will only allocate a certain number of people to you. You can decide who those people are going to be. And anyone you don't decide is going to be reallocated to another activity. Now, this is not so, so far different from what happens within a large firm. A big multinational allocates people to development projects. I mean, if, from my experience in a big computer company back in the 1970s, you were at, there were projects to which people were allocated for a, certain, for a year or two to develop something, and then you'd be allocated to something else. You didn't have any particular say over that, but there's no reason why you couldn't have. This thing couldn't be done with people having a say over it. Yes, rather than having a kind of hierarchical managerial process determining that, you could have a participatory democratic process determining that, yeah. where it's the collective rather than some manager, being some manager's prerogative. I mean, this is the point where Connell was saying, oh, you can only have central planning if you appoint a manager to do it. No, that's not the case. You can do it through a labour budget. This collective has a certain budget of a certain number of people. The people can either be direct workers or they can be, you can use the labour budget in terms of indirect labour or, or, or products you're using. And it's up to you to decide how to do it. What it sounds to me you're describing is there is effectively a worker council who say is running Asda, let's say, which if people don't know, that's a supermarket chain. And what's happening there in terms of hiring and firing is that they're operating within a, a context in a system, which so there are external boundaries and parameters, in this case, say on labor. And within that context, they have autonomy or control over how they want to do that. Yes, it's essentially budgetary control, but un demystified budgetary control budgetary control with the fetishism taken out because it's dealing with what budgets are really about, which is ultimately about human time. I'm thinking in every in every system, so let's say if we think about market socialism, so let's say Varoufakis's model another now, if we think about participatory economics and if we talk about towards a new socialism, in every system there production units have some kind of external constraint. There has to be kind of by definition. In, in a market socialist system, it's basically your ability to buy and sell goods on a market and acquire capital and so forth. Part, in a participatory economy, it is your engagement with the, the planning process and the the indicative prices that are generated through this balancing of supply and demand of production proposals and consumption proposals. Effectively, this generates these prices for inputs and outputs, and then the worker council can can do whatever they want within that those constraints effectively. And then in towards the new socialism, it's similar in my mind enough to participatory economics in the sense that again there's an external process. So this time, rather than that being the planning procedure and participatory economics. It's it's a different kind of planning procedure, but that will set the uh, external constraints, and then worker council can make their decisions within that. I mean, yes, the sort of example if if you're Airbus, you're going to be set if you're developing a new aircraft. It's maybe ten years before the, from the start of the project to developing it. So during that period, the workers who are doing working on the new thing are being paid by the public. The public has to have decided that they want to invest 
so many hundred thousand or worker years in developing a new airliner. At the same time, the planned environmental constraints will say this airliner is going to have to operate with liquid hydrogen and it's got to have a certain range. They will be met with constraints which are partly from national resources, partly due to environment, partly due to the range that the airlines say they need, etc. And they've got to meet that that specification. How they do it and how they design it is up to them because the planning authorities don't have the knowledge for that. So b- back to this question of hiring, firing, and just, just talk about this for a few minutes and then we'll, we'll leave it there and we'll pick up again. Speaking of external constraints, we can stick within your time constraints. So somebody might think, okay, let's think of a situation where there emerges a kind of political struggle or a, a labour struggle, I suppose, in, in the case of you're talking about, say, reducing 10% of the labour in a certain project because whatever way the, the planning process has occurred, it, it's been determined determined that it would be more a better use of society's productive capacity for for that labor to be allocated to another project like you're saying from retail to power generation and so you know the obvious thing to think of is okay well what if the workers in that project think well i don't want to you know i'm happy where i am and i know we can think of different uh, versions of this but I, I know that there are going to be a lot of socialists who are wary of central planning and, and it's, it's precisely this kind of thing that they might be thinking of so I'm just interested to see how you would respond to that well if, if society is going to adapt people have to move okay how, how do you do that well if if you've got a system based on labor budgets the collective is only allowed to employ a certain number of people or only a, a certain number of people are allowed to be working for it they can nominate who those people are going to be if they want and once they've nominated who those people are going to be if someone who they haven't nominated wants to go on working there they're not going to be credited with any labor credits because they're not not doing something that's socially necessary so you could stay on but you're not going to get an income you d- you don't have the personal privilege of being supported by society to do something which isn't necessary. One way to a worker council could resolve that, which is something that many cooperatives have done, say during economic crises, is that you just reduce hours and you spread out the work. Um, well, no, well, well, actually, no, you can't do that because you know, this is transferring. The problem is a shortage of labour. Yeah, so yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're you are dealing with the opposite situation, yes. which is a capitalist recession. Yes, yeah. You don't get that in socialist economies. Yeah, socialist economies are tight they're resource constrained yes exactly so you know so actually a certain number of people do actually have to move so it's a, a matter of trying to figure out who's more most willing to move i mean say if we compare this to if we just forget the participatory economics for, for a second we look at a market system i mean you're talking about fetishism of budgets and it's interesting to think about um often a market system is presented as a model of decentralization and autonomy and to a certain extent it, it is depending on how you look at it but there is always that process that you're existing within which is the system of market prices and exchange and just because there isn't a kind of political direction saying your labor budget is reduced doesn't mean that there isn't an algorithm which is not under your control which is deciding how much labor that you can use and it is important for people to keep in mind there's always an algorithm or a process yes. that production users are existing within and it's a, it's a matter of of picking the one that we think is the best but the the problem is that if you leave it to a market system you can't guarantee full employment there's no reason why a system of independent cooperatives should ensure full employment. That is correct, with the caveat that with state intervention, there can be full employment, but the market itself, the private sector, cannot uh, necessarily. There's there's no reason, economical, historical or otherwise, that the private sector will generate full employment. And we know historically that in the one country where self-managed market socialism was tried for a prolonged period, which is Yugoslavia. It had many advantages compared to a capitalist economy and it achieved decent growth rates. But the economy had chronic unemployment, which was solved by emigration to work in Germany as Gastarbeiter. It didn't actually solve the full employment problem. It also didn't didn't solve regional differential problems of regional differentials, which became critical in the in the end. Indeed, yeah, with very tragic consequences. Okay, so yeah. um, we will leave that there for now. A fantastic discussion as usual. I know people find this fascinating. I certainly do. Okay. Okay, goodbye. Bye for now. 
Thank you for watching. If you got anything from this video, then please press the like button, consider subscribing, and if you really enjoyed it, then get an After the Oligarchy tattoo on your face with a typo so it says After the Oily Garlic. There's a lot more to come. We'll keep exploring better futures for humanity until we get there. And as always, I want to read your thoughts in the comment section below. This channel has a wonderful audience and there are usually some very interesting comments under the video, so let's continue that. That's all for now. Our democratic future lies after the oligarchy.